You know, my entire life has been spent thinking about and dealing with numbers, data, facts, science, law, proof, and then digging into those subjects deeper than most of those around me to find out what is really going on. You know, as an example, I'm sure you know that people that use Google for research, which is pretty much everybody, rarely go past the visible part of the homepage, the front page, and that less than 10% go to page two. Another very small fraction go to page three. I'm that researcher. I go to page 10. And then if I'm still not finding the needed information, I change the search and I keep on going. I'm not bragging. I'm just reporting. That's how I run. Well, I've loved science my entire life. My best friend, Harvey Levitt, and I, we spent hours in the local creek collecting rocks and arrowheads and lizards and butterflies and dragonflies and tadpoles and snakes and more. And at age seven, we had terrariums and displays with mounted samples of those rocks and those butterflies and everything else that I just mentioned. We had the names and they were mounted on sheets. And, and you know, I, I have to admit, Harvey was a big inspiration for that whole thing, but I loved every bit of it. In fact, my interest in birds had me as a member of the Audubon Society at that same age of seven. Well, my search for truth and laws and understanding took me to law school, but I ultimately decided against that career because it was more about the distortion of the law than about finding of truth. Well, obviously, a love of numbers and science is helpful if you're going to spend up, spend the biggest portion of your life running a manufacturing company, a plastics manufacturing company, or spend 17 years helping small businesses become successful and then writing books about it, including books on accounting. So yeah, math, science, yes, getting into the details, getting into the nitty gritty, doing the research. That's what I've loved doing and continue to do now on this YouTube channel. But those combined interests had me thinking the other day, and I put down this series of thoughts that I know these are not unique to me. Other people have come up with kind of the same idea, but maybe you haven't ever thought about it quite this way. So it starts with this. The thing that is most real in the physical realm is physics. You've heard people say that. Lots of scientists say that. In fact, I think you would find it hard to get an argument from any scientist or any philosopher that the thing in the physical realm that is most real is physics. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Is that the one thing that we know is real? Anyway, we know about physics, that it has laws. These laws are immutable. Um, though we might not fully understand them, they are immutable. <laughs> physics is also observable through our senses. And then physics is quantifiable. That's really an important part of physics. It's quantifiable. In fact, we, in fact, we quantify physics using various languages. But when it comes down to it, it's mostly letters and numbers. And even the letters are basically a subset of numbers. So all of physics kind of comes down to numbers. So all of reality comes down to these numbers that we use to quantify this thing that we are able to see and to understand through our senses. Well, whether or not we ever, we, the, the, the reality is here is that we have no idea why these laws exist. We have no idea why the physical laws of nature, the physics of nature. We have no idea why these first principles exist. We have no idea why they're immutable. We have no idea why they continue to be the same. You have to, I guess that's what immutable means, right? Anyway, <laughs> whether or not we ever answer the big questions of origin, our purpose, our destiny, we know we can count on physics. And so I think a lot of people today, as we see all this amazing engineering and we live so well, a lot of people don't even ask the question anymore about origin, our purpose, our destiny. I still ask those questions, but I think they're a subset of the question of where does physics come from? Why does it exist? And why is it always the same, never changing? Because if even one thread changes, the entire thing unravels in a minute, right? I mean, let me know in, again in the comments below. So then think about that. The underlying premise of the part of existence that most of us believed believe that is the closest to the truth 
is 100 oblique, 100 percent, 100 percent oblique to our understanding. We don't have the beginning of a theory as to why the laws of the universe are immutable. The more common discussion about such things that you know philosophers have been asking for thousands of years about origins, purpose, and destiny, we have absolutely no idea how matter has come into being. No, zero, no idea. We have zero understanding or any good theories about how life comes from non-life. We thought we had those theories a few years ago, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. We had all kinds of ideas about how life came from non-life. Uh, today, as advanced as we are, we have no theory. We have no idea. We certainly have no idea why we humans are blessed with self-awareness and curiosity and reason or how to describe any type of purpose to our lives. Then we wonder why in the world we end up with morality, ethics, or all the things that seem to be rooted in our conscience, whatever that is, and where does it reside? We have no idea. Of course, we haven't thought at getting to understanding in this particular essay, we haven't thought about such things as hope, love, beauty, and those kinds of things. Then you get to the afterlife. <laughs> okay, well, then, <laughs> then we really get into something which is contentious, except that most, a lot of people don't contend at all. You just might say, I don't know, not you, but there's people out there that say they're 100% certain that when we die, that is all there is. But then if you believe that, I'm sorry to say it, you're not only intellectually uncurious, but you're actually intellectually dishonest. You cannot know something doesn't exist. That's impossible. It's a, it's a, if we have any kind of aspect of the way that we think about reason or think about the way things are, you cannot posit that something doesn't. You can talk about it. You can say, the, on balance, the evidence tells me. I've looked at all the evidence that I possibly could, at least the amount that I've had time to do and the, and the amount of interest that I've had. And, and to the extent that I've, I care about that, I've really looked into it and after all the study I've done for an hour or two or five or 20 or 100 hours or 1,000 hours, I've finally determined that there is no life. I, I, that's just my belief. I believe it. I don't know it because that would be intellectually dishonest. I believe, based on all the evidence, that it's more likely than not that nothing happens after we die. Well, I've looked at the facts over and over and over, and here are some that actually sway me. These are some interesting facts that are just kind of sway me. I think about these. Maybe they'll sway you. Maybe they won't sway you at all. But I, I'd love to know in the comments below what your answer is to them. Uh, you know, I, well, let me know. Jerusalem, big part of the news right now, as it almost always is. Jerusalem is a miracle. Why is the seat of the three largest and most influential religions on earth, why is there an ongoing battle, even in the modern era, for this tiny hundred acres of land? <laughs> How is it that a 4,000-year-old text has God saying that Abraham will be the father of many nations, and we have the clear history to prove that this took place? There's no other such prophecy, just that one, and it turned out to be true. And then there's this place called Jerusalem, which was the seat of the, the chosen people that has turned out to be this contentious place for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, right up until the present. How is it that more than a 2,000-year-old text had God saying he would disperse those chosen people, the Jews, over the entire earth, that they would be despised, and that eventually he would regather them back again to Jerusalem. He would regather them as a people and bring them back to Jerusalem. Do you, can you give me one other, other example of anybody like the Jews in this regard that have been dispersed and then reunited, and that there was a prophecy that said in advance, thousands of years before it happened, that it would take place? So you see, on the one hand, you can say, well, yeah, there's been this other little group that was dispersed for 100 years or 500 years, and they came back. You know, no, no, no. But was there any prophecy regarding that? It's the combination, you see. It's the combination of of the Bible saying that Abraham would be the father of many nations, and that he was, as opposed to saying, well, there's also this other, there's these, you know, other religions that are large, you know, but there was no prophecy that somebody would be, that that would happen over time, that these would be the largest, anyway, the largest bodies of peoples in the world.
Anyway, uh, the Bible is filled with hundreds of additional prophecies, prophecies, and every single one of them has either been fulfilled or has not yet been incorrect as it has yet to be fulfilled. There's still the possibility that prophecy has the chance that it could be fulfilled at a later date. There is no possible aspect of it that could not yet still be fulfilled. In fact, if there was one such example, it would be a headline in whatever has replaced the New York Times as the, as the newspaper of record. Uh, that would be something on the internet. I guess Google would have maybe some big banner that would say, oh, here's a Bible prophecy that has not come true. Um, by the way, the Bible also has an explanation for the beginning. It has a it has an explanation for purpose. It has an explanation for love, beauty, and the afterlife, all in one nice little book that has sold more copies than any other book in history, et cetera, et cetera. You've probably heard all that before. It also has the key to how physics is always the same and always true. It tells us right in the Bible why that is true. Well, 39 years ago, after I took a detour in my life away from these truths, because I believed many scientific statements I believe these statements. I kept hearing these statements at high school and college, and then they turned out to be false. Uh, I, I've done a whole uh, uh, YouTube video on this earlier, but one of those was that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, which was kind of the linchpin for me in terms of my leaving the church. And then when it turned out not to be true, it was kind of one of the linchpins that threw me back. It was a factual scientific issue that caused me to go, uh. I think I need to rethink the reasons why I went towards science only, as opposed to the beautiful situation where you can both believe science and also believe Christ. Anyway, I returned to my first love. Maybe you've strayed away from your upbringing in a Christian home, or maybe you were disillusioned as I was by science or by some part of the religion that you couldn't square with God's teaching. Maybe you wondered how a loving God could allow such evil or how to reconcile some of your prayers that you prayed and prayed and prayed and they went unanswered. I can't know your story. All I can say is I've studied the subject in great, de great detail my entire life. I left the church for 16 years, but the facts pulled me back and the truth melted my heart. Two years ago, I had open heart surgery I was getting ready for the anesthesia, about ready to go under, and I contemplated that I might not survive the operation. My only thought was, it's okay. Whatever happens, it's okay. I know where I'm going. Do you know? It was great comfort to, to, to know. I knew exactly where I was going. If you think maybe it's time to really rethink your current relationship or lack thereof with God, you might want to head out to church today on Easter Sunday or you know, you if you don't not sure quite what you want to do, you could contact me. You know, my information is still out there. You can find my email online. You can find me. You can go on uh, on X and you can you can DM me directly on X. It's all quite available. You can put a comment down below and say, "Hey, Randy, I'd really like to talk." You know, I'll see your comment. Um, I'm available. I'd love to talk to you about where you are in this part of your walk because. You know, none of us is getting any older. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> none of us is getting any older. Well, I think the opposite is true. None of us is getting any younger. We're all headed towards that day uh, when we're going to find out whether or not there is such a thing as life after death and what it really means and who was really right or wrong. Uh, again, if you're interested in having more of a conversation, love to have that conversation or just head out to your local church, and uh, maybe you'll find somebody to talk to there who can really walk you through it in such a way uh, that you can then have an ongoing relationship with that individual. Anyway, I hope this was interesting, at least. I, maybe it moved you. Maybe it didn't move you. Um, maybe maybe it'll start you thinking about something. I hope it does. Um, it's been great, as always, talking to you.